During the 18th and 19th centuries, thousands of water-powered mills were built along Virginia's rivers and streams. These mills provided an important service by accepting grain from the farming communities and producing flour and meal products. The grain was stone ground, a method which in one form or another has been in use for thousands of years. A few of these old mills survive, but only a very few have been restored to operating condition. One mill, operating as it has for more than 200 years, is Woodson's Mill, located on the Piney River in Lowesville, Virginia. Gil Brockenbrough, owner of the mill, invited me to tour the mill, and on a fine spring morning, I drove to the mill. I want to welcome you to Woodson's Mill. Today we're grinding. This mill has operated uh, with various small periods of, uh, of downtime for almost uh, those 200 years plus. And uh, today it operates very much as it did probably around 1900 when Dr. Woodson first purchased and expanded the mill. Yeah, and if I can take you inside, I'd love to show you around. You can see today we're grinding. We're grinding corn today and producing cornmeal and grits. Um, this is very much as the mill has existed from the very beginning. And in the 19th century and into the early part of the 20th century, mills such as this really hundreds of them, even in Virginia, existed as a center of the agricultural community. And at that time we were an agricultural society. And the mill was more or less uh, served as a community center, really, with uh, farmers gathering, and discussing their crops. and uh, So it was a center of the community and a center of the trade. And the miller was usually uh, one of the more established members of the community, as Dr. Woodson certainly was, uh, serving as a, a medical doctor, the state senator for Amherst and Nelson County for over 20 years, and um, very much involved in both agriculture and milling, and medicine and the legislature, uh, more or less a, a renaissance man of his time. So today we're following in his footsteps, Joe Mays and myself, and uh, we're carrying on a, a two-century-old tradition uh, that still has its place today, not just historically, but in producing a, an excellent product that uh, is more and more appreciated by people that, uh, that enjoy uh, a higher quality and better tasting food. And today, you see we're grinding corn, and it's ground very slowly, as opposed to commercial mills. Now the fact that it's ground slowly means several things, the most important of which is that no friction and heat are created, or at least a minimal amount, so that this meal comes out with all the oil, all the nutrition, of the corn itself. It's never more than 10 degrees above the atmospheric temperature at the time. So you have a very healthy and very flavorful product. Uh, when we bake fresh cornmeal, uh, cornbread, using fresh cornmeal like that, it's almost like you've picked the corn out of the field that day. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a tradition around here to to take off a bag of this and take it up to the house and, and have it uh, for dinner that evening. And uh, it's quite flavorful. So, at this point, we're producing cornmeal and grits. And grits are our signature product. The ground corn goes through a scalper. And we have to step up here to really watch what's going on. Now earlier the corn has been dumped into the hopper for the bucket elevator and taken overhead. 
And from that point, it fills this hopper above the stone. Now, the large wheel is rotating at uh, about 12, 10 to 12 RPM, which through the gearing turns the stone at approximately 72 RPM. Now, uh, a stone, a millstone, is really a, a set of stones, or as they're known, a run of stones. The stationary stone is the bed stone, the bottom stone. And the runner stone, obviously from its name, is the one that is moving. Now that is controlled, the speed of it is controlled here, which controls a press frame, which is more like, uh, it's sort of like the clutch in a, in a, in a car. Um, the distance between the stones is controlled by another apparatus, mechanical apparatus, and that creates a tolerance between the stones, which gives you the proper grind. It's all done with water power. We're not, uh, we're not using any uh, resources here. Uh, we simply Take the water, it's run over the wheel, it's returned to the river. Uh, so ecologically speaking, it's, it's a very, very handsome process. All milling, to one degree or another, uh, owes a great debt to Oliver Evans. Although this is not strictly an Evans type mill, I'd say all milling owes a great debt to Oliver Evans and, and of course all industrial procedures. One of the basic uh, of his inventions and innovations was the bucket elevator which takes tons of grain up 60 feet in this case a double handful at a time by continuous action that is run by shaft attached to the water wheel. Now prior to Oliver Evans time uh, in the late 1790s um, the miller, actually, over his shoulder, took the, the grain upstairs, and then gravity took its, uh, its play. So this was an apparatus, as simple though as it seems to us today, it was very, very uh, innovative at the time, and it cheated gravity. And uh, so it, uh, it made use of the force of the water to take the product up, for grinding, then after grinding, to take it back up for packing or storage. Very simple thing, we take it for granted today, but uh, it, uh, it was a quantum leap in technology at its time. And Oliver Evans developed many, many uh, of the tenets of basic mill writing uh, that, that are used even com in commercial mills today. This water wheel is a restoration of the original Fitz water wheel that was placed here around 1900. At that time it replaced a wooden water wheel. This is 12 and a half feet tall by uh, eight and a half feet in diameter. It's built upon the original frame and when we began restoration in the early 1980s this was pretty much filled in and the wheel was rusted out. The raceway had been filled in and overgrown. So it was a question of really taking, uh, taking those few parts and what knowledge we had uh, of Fitz water wheels uh, of the time. It was very difficult to find people uh, artisans, craftsmen, and whatever that could uh, could build replacement parts and recreate uh, equipment that uh, had deteriorated here at the mill. But it was a slow, laborious, and expensive process. But we now operate. <laughs>
So it's all about water when you're talking about a mill. Now we pull our water from the Piney River, which on this side of me is only several hundred yards. Where our dam is, beyond here, as the crow flies, is about a quarter of a mile. So around here we have a raceway. And the head power of the raceway is what creates the power, the mill itself. Because this lake can be built up over a period overnight or over a period of days if necessary during periods of drought. So when the Piney River is very low, we have floodgates up there and gates here and we can build up a massive head of water so that we can grind regardless of the level of the river. In, in my years here, um, only 16 years, uh, we, we have never been unable to grind. And with my uh, friendship with the Woodson family and whatever, I know that since 1900, uh, there's never been a problem. <laughs> So that is really what the, the lake, the mill pond, is all about. It's a storage battery. And it simply impounds the water from the river and, as needed, feeds it to the mill itself. Now we have this stone today ready to turn over and dress it. And dressing a stone is a very laborious process that really takes one man perhaps a 40-hour week to do a set of stones or a run of stones. Now this, of course, is the new stone. It's only been here 100 years. But uh, with proper care, it should probably be here another 200 years. Now once the stone is on the blocks, Joe will release the pressure from the crane and let it stabilize itself so that he can begin dressing the, the stone. The stone wears unevenly as a natural process of the abrasion. And the thing to do in dressing these furrows is to get rid of any, any high points and create a fur that is narrow at the top, at the inset, and deepens as it goes out. Now this is a cross-dressed stone, and uh, excuse me, it, it gets finer as it goes out. This is called a master fur, and this would be a journeyman ferrer and the smallest is a prentice ferrer and I don't know why but that's just the way they go. But dressing the stones is the heart of the process. An improperly dressed stone will simply crush the grain rather than giving it its fine and consistent grind. As you can see Joe's wearing eye protection so I'll stand back a little bit but it's simply a tap, tap, tap of the miller's hammer. Now, not every miller had the skill to dress his own stones, and so there were itinerant millwrights that went around and would dress stones. I can feel a few specks of stone hitting me now in the face. It is one tap at a time. There's no way to hurry it up. As you can see with this, or as I can feel standing here, you get little specks of stone and little specks of metal from the steel of the hammer. And that's where it, the phrase comes from that you can tell a miller by his metal. Because he would have specks of stone and steel in his arm after a lifetime of working the stone. Now Joe is going to check his work in the condition of the stone using a staff, which is a very simple instrument, but it's precisely level and it's chalked on the edge. 
so that he'll take that and rotate that around the surface of the stone. And that chalk will show where the high spots are because that'll catch the chalk. And then he knows where he has to go back and continue his work. This will show any high spots that need a little more work. As I say, it's a very exacting job, but it is the part of the heart of the, the milling process. Now the stone appears to be properly dressed. One or two little spots there, Joe, but I think it'll be all right. Now this stone, well then we'll reverse the process and put it back in place here in its uh, skirt on top of the uh, of the bedstone. Now normally at this time the bedstone would also be dressed in a similar manner but uh, for all intents and purposes we are ready to grind at this point and as I say with proper care this stone will last a, another 200 years and uh, we hope uh, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren are here to enjoy it. It was time to go. Buckwheat, the miller's cat, made a rare appearance as I left the mill. I thank Joe and Gil for the tour of the mill and with my bag of freshly ground cornmeal left for home. Woodson's mill is about an hour's drive from Charlottesville south on Route 29, then west on 56 and 778 to Lowesville. The mill is open each Saturday from 8 until 4. Gil and Joe welcome visitors, and a peaceful rest area provides space for a sack lunch. A tour of this working mill demonstrates the basics of water power and milling, and is well worth the trip.